Since 1981, El Salvador's armed forces have received almost $200 million worth of arms, ammunition, communications gear, and training from the United States. The Army now has the look of a powerful and professional military machine. But the military situation here, officially described as a stalemate, is in fact deteriorating sending tremors from the battlefront all the way to Washington. Despite a substantial increase in the number of government troops and two years of U.S. training, the Army has failed to blunt the guerrillas' current offensive, which began in September. El Salvador will receive $65 million worth of military aid this year from the United States. According to military sources here, the High Command has requested almost triple that amount, more than $160 million for next year, to try to regain the initiative lost to the guerrillas this fall. The fighting has been concentrated in four provinces east of the Lempa River. This map, based on information provided by U.S. and Salvadoran military analysts, shows areas now either influenced or controlled by the guerrillas. Their strategy has always been to declare the eastern third of El Salvador a liberated zone. Only a dramatic turn in the Army's fortunes now seems likely to prevent the guerrillas from eventually achieving their objective. We spent five days in the eastern part of El Salvador this month. We visited towns like El Cuco and Chirilagua, where the guerrillas sarcastically thanked President Reagan for the M-16 automatic weapons they claim to have captured from government soldiers. Ironically, the guerrillas are also benefiting from the Food for Peace program meant to bolster El Salvador's government. At the health clinic in Chirilagua, the nurse told us the latest shipment of U.S. aid arrived two months after Chirilagua fell to the rebels, who carted away some of the food for their own use. Meanwhile, U.S.-trained immediate reaction battalions are trying to reverse guerrilla advances in the east. The oldest and best is the Atlacat. Like a fire brigade, Major Jose Azmitia's elite troops are sent in once a battle is underway, or once an army garrison has already fallen to the guerrillas. We asked him why El Salvador's regular army has done so poorly east of the Lempa. You need a relationship of uh, forces uh, of uh, at least 10 to 1 in order to be more effective and uh, that operations are more efficient. But uh, some of our units, our uh, newly born units, or uh, do not uh, have uh, their equipment or their training complete, just, uh, you know, partially equipped and partially trained. They have no uh, combat experience. They, they were just uh, organized uh, two or three months ago. And they have been just through basic training and put in combat. And they have not done uh, very well. San Vicente province, just west of the Lempa River, is another problem for the government. Just five months ago, U.S. officials were claiming the province was free of guerrillas due to a model pacification program called the National Plan. But this fall, Army Hunter battalions failed to prevent the guerrillas from re-infiltrating San Vicente, a major setback for El Salvador's armed forces and the United States. The failure demonstrates the Army's continuing problems, insufficient manpower, inadequate leadership, and above all, inexperience. Few soldiers re-enlist because of low pay, $21 a month for a private and low morale. The Hunter battalions, trained by U.S. advisors, were to have carried out search and destroy missions in the countryside while the Army deployed its main force near San Vicente's sugar mills and other potential economic targets. The Army's strategy was to prevent the guerrillas from destroying the fall harvest, and with it, El Salvador's already war-ravaged economy. 
but with thousands of soldiers tied down guarding fixed positions, the guerrillas attacked lightly defended towns. General Carlos Eugenio Vides Casanova is El Salvador's defense minister. At this time, when we are guarding all the economic and agricultural infrastructure of the country, we are left with less resources to employ in direct operations or in concentrated actions at any given moment. The subversives, in their actions, as you well know, have all of the advantages because they choose the moment, the place, and the time at which to launch their attack. They have the ability to assemble their units. They give them uniforms at the time of battle to wear for 15 minutes. Afterwards, they go as civilians. They hide their weapons, which makes it very difficult for the armed forces to discover them. Earlier this month, we encountered a guerrilla patrol in the town of Santa Clara, just 12 miles from San Vicente's provincial capital. The guerrillas agreed with the defense minister's analysis. That is, that the army is spread too thin to retain effective and permanent control everywhere in San Vicente. The army comes here for six days or so, but then it goes and leaves this town unprotected because it's not capable of maintaining its position here with only a small force of a hundred soldiers or so. If the army could keep a battalion here, it could retain control. But it can't afford such a large commitment, perhaps because the situation is very difficult in other places where the army's being hit and attacked, where we're capturing many of their soldiers. So it's when they're forced to pull their forces from out of here, sending them elsewhere, then we regain control. The guerrillas are not, however, invincible. In November, the army successfully repelled two attacks on the town of San Lorenzo, which has become the symbol of the pacification program in San Vicente province. Today, adults continue rebuilding war-shattered buildings with materials provided by El Salvador's government and paid for by the United States. Reminders of the recent fighting are everywhere. But now, children play peacefully in the town square. <laughs> Soldiers keep a constant, if sometimes sleepy, watch, knowing the guerrillas are gone, but not far away. The army points to San Lorenzo as proof the government still controls most of San Vicente province and that the pacification program is still viable. But Defense Minister Vides Casanova told us that at best, the war will drag on indefinitely if El Salvador does not receive more military aid from the United States. I'm telling you in all frankness that the assistance is not enough, but I'm positive that on the day we can improve our air mobility and are able to mobilize small contingents to many points at the same time, preventing the enemy from appearing and withdrawing to other places, we will have much greater effectiveness. Do you need more helicopters in order to improve the military situation? More helicopters and more land transportation vehicles, but specifically, it's more helicopters that we need. The Army also needs more and better communications equipment, more soldiers, more training, more guns, and more ammunition. All of this costs money, money only the United States can provide with no guarantee the Army can defeat the guerrillas militarily. But the situation here is not yet irreversible. Despite heavy fighting and serious losses in the east, the government still controls most of the western two-thirds of El Salvador. And the army believes it will be in a better position to go on the offensive again now that the harvest season is almost over. But military analysts here and in Washington are worried. They're now trying to determine whether the latest guerrilla offensive was a decisive turning point in this war or just another setback for the Army. They're also trying to determine whether the Army, given enough time, training, and U.S. support, can defeat the guerrillas. 
or whether a major escalation of U.S. involvement here will be necessary to prevent a guerrilla victory. This is Charles Krauss reporting from El Salvador. 